Hello, my name is Guillermo Gallego, and in this video, we will take a look at event representations. So welcome to the zoo. If you take a look at uh, different papers on event-based vision, then you will see that there are many different representation of events. Ideally, we know what the event stream produced by a DBS uh, contains. So the pixel coordinates, the timestamp, and the polarity of these brightness changes in time. Uh, yet we see that events are uh, easily converted or treated as in, in different ways. So they could be treated as point sets or in, on the image plane as an evolving set or a set a group of events are treated as a point cloud. Uh, it's easy to see uh, events converted into some uh, frame representations such as uh, histogram, time surface or uh, motion compensated event frames. And more recently, even events are converted into 3D grid representations such as voxel grids, uh, or events could be reconstructed into brightness images. Let's walk through some of these representations. So, point sets. There are events, as we know, they are sparse in, in space time in the in the image plane. Every event has the pixel coordinates, the timestamp of the brightness change and the polarity. Um, so we could if we have uh, several of these they form kind of a, an event stream that it's more or less continuous in time and they give us these brightness changes in a, in a, in a sparse uh, an asynchronous signal on the image plane. So we could have an algorithm that uh, deals with events individually. And that would be, for example, of uh, filters, the case of filters uh, and or spiking neural networks, right? And they consume one event at a time. We will see about this later. That's basically what a, an event is, a change detection or a DBS event is. Uh, if we consider several of these, like, here on this plot on the right, which are these dots, either gray or, or black, then now we are not dealing with individual events. We are dealing with events as a collection of things, right? Like in this case, a 3D point set. We treat events as points in space time, and we think of them as, as a collection, as a group, as a point cloud. And there are, with every representation, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantage uh, of, for example, this 3D point set representation compared to other ones is that it preserves the space-time information. So we preserve the uh, timestamp of each event. Of course, we preserve the XY coordinate. And the disadvantage is that, well, if you, it may introduce some latency because it, you need to wait for some events in this case I don't know, 20 milliseconds is represented in this in this plot, but you could wait for, oh wait, from like four milliseconds from 18 to 22, or you could wait for uh, a shorter amount of time to process them all together, not just to process one event. Um, so this is another representation, a point set, and we also have, instead of a 3D point set, we could have a 2D point set, which basically we are treating events as a time-evolving shape on the image plane. And this is quite intuitive since events uh, are caused by moving edges, and edges also are the basis of uh, shape representation. So we are thinking of events as basically a time-evolving shape on the image plane. It's made more like a 2D point set rather than a 3D point set. Because at nowhere in, in during this process we, we try to plot or use um, events at different times uh, on the same pixel. It's quite rare. Okay, so let's move on to other representations. Uh, event frames. These are uh, very popular representations where events, for example, here capital E, uh, some events in space-time neighborhood, they are converted into 2D images, like for the example the ones on the right. Uh, we can clearly identify the individual events in these images. Basically, we are uh, also plotting the absence of events, right, with these grayscale values. And we could discard polarity, like on the on the rightmost uh, plot. So there are many different types of event frames. It could be histograms of events. Uh, basically, we count pixel-wise how many events happened, or we could pixel-wise 
balance uh, the event polarities. So count how many positive and how many negative events are and just sum them. We could have saturated histograms. Uh, so only, for example, produce an image that has only three values, whether the last event was positive, was negative, or there was no event. And time surfaces, they are they are to the images after all, so they are some kind of event frame, <coughs> but we'll discuss them separately. And then there are questions about this is uh, how many events do you consider or what's the, the selection criterion? Uh, so the sliding window, for example, in this space time neighborhood, how do you select them? Well, you could choose, for example, uh, to select all the events in a time interval of a given size, capital T. That's more or less converting the asynchronous signal into a synchronous one. Or you could uh, use a constant number of events uh, to plot or the, to convert them into a frame. And because the events come asynchronously and the data produced by the sensors depends on the texture, well, this constant number of events would still give a synchronous uh, frame. Or you could have other strategies, uh, adaptive area event number or whatever. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of these event frames? Well, they may have some advantages because they are actually very popular. They have a high impact. Perhaps the most important one is that event frames, they are compatible with conventional computer vision because we are converting the unfamiliar event output uh, into familiar images. And therefore, then after that, we are able to reutilize methods from standard cameras. They also have an intuitive and informative in interpretation because events are caused by moving edges and therefore these event frames, they look like edge maps. And we know that edges convey a lot of the information of a scene. They are also good as baselines of what uh, is achievable. So we could do like quick prototyping, convert the events into frames and use uh, conventional computer vision algorithms to see what would be a reasonable, I don't know, the output of a, of a system, the accuracy. And that's also good if you develop a new algorithm, you can compare to what would be, um, for example, in terms of accuracy, um, the comparison between the current algorithm that I'm developing and the algorithm that I could develop if I converted events into frames. Of course, there are many metrics that you could use here, uh, not just uh, accuracy, but you would also need to take into account power, so efficiency and memory and other things. But it's just um, one of the um, usefulness of, the, of this representation. And basically, if you create frames from events that are HDR and uh, asynchronous they, in the frames, <clears throat> they still inherit the properties, the HDR properties of the events, and they, if you collect them into a fixed number of uh, events per frame, then they are still asynchronous. What are the disadvantages? Well, they are not the event-based paradigm that we are uh, trying to build upon because timestamps are quantized. We are spending power in recreating frames and um, there is some latency introduced because we are we need to wait for some time to collect all these uh, events that will give us uh, an event frame and there is also uh, one key parameter so the algorithm or the, the representation is very sensitive to this parameter that is the number of events to use which may be difficult to tune <clears throat> as an example you see here uh, with two different scenes, uh, sparse texture and dense texture. Uh, on the top row, we see what happens if you use a constant uh, time slice um, of 10 milliseconds, that, right? So <clears throat> basically you're able to capture very well, depends on the motion, of course, but you're able to capture dense uh, texture, but maybe not so well a sparse texture. If you use a constant number of events, um, say for example, 10,000 events, well, these 10,000 events, if the scene has a lot of texture, they happen in a very short time interval and these uh, <clears throat> events happen everywhere on the image plane, but we don't collect many events per pixel. 
uh, therefore we don't see here like a clear edge map. Whereas if the events are concentrated in a small region of the image, well, then we see a much clearer uh, um, shape or edge map. And there are other areas such as proposed here by Liu and Dabrook in BMBC 2018 that you use like a, an adaptive, uh, some sampling area and um, to try to get the best of, of both worlds, right? Try to have a criterion that it works both on texture uh, scenes as well as uh, sparse scenes. Among the event frames, uh, there's maybe one that uh, it's more popular, it's called the brightness increment images, and they are obtained by accumulating event polarities pixel-wise. These are basically the representations <clears throat> on the bottom of this figure. Over a grayscale canvas, we plot with bright or dark pixels, and uh, every pixel accumulates the number of uh, events, uh, basically the, the polarity of the events. So Bright means that there were a few events with positive polarity, and dark means there were events with negative polarity. And the brighter or darker it gets, it means that there were more or more events with positive and negative polarities. <clears throat> and this is a very intuitive representation. So on the top we see <clears throat> the a grayscale frame of the scene, and on the bottom we see what happens when we accumulate, say. 0.01 events per pixel to 0.5 events per pixel. <clears throat> Basically, these images are the ones that you would get if you had, for example, two of these uh, grayscale frames consecutive in times and you would subtract them. Depending on how far apart these uh, video frames are, then you would get um, one, uh, one of these uh, brightness increment images. And they are good, yeah, because they have this intuitive uh, meaning that they are incremental images. And polarity is used, it's not discarded. And they have been used for many, many things, such as for stereo depth estimation, for camera pulse estimation, like in this example, for optical flow estimation. You can also use them for uh, grayscale frame prediction. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to. Another representation, these are called time surfaces, and it's basically a, a time map. It's an image where every pixel value is a function of uh, the time of the last events uh, at those pixels. And we could separate them by polarity as it's here um, represented in the figure. So basically, we have an event camera that gives us these on or off events, and we could represent these are very short time. Um, um, representations, but if we collected the events for, in theory, an infinite amount of time, we would see what happened at every pixel, and then we could have this kind of spatial-temporal images, or they are also called, I think, motion history images in computer vision. Basically, every pixel here is represented with a color, and the color is kind of telling us how far away in the past the event happened. So bright means that it happened uh, very recently, and uh, here dark red means that it happened uh, far away in time. And this is, for example, only for the for the off events, right? You see these two fronts, black fronts here are these the two fronts, bright fronts here on the on this. C inset. And this timestamp map, they can be uh, further emphasized using exponential kernels. And basically, the output is an image, but if, if you represent this as an elevation map, well, then it looks like a time surface, that, therefore the name. But that's basically it. What are some of the advantages? Well, this type of representation exposes the rich temporal information of events. Uh, we can see it clearly here, right? We can see that for sparse scenes uh, like this one, that there are only a couple of edges, um, we can see very far away in time what happened with the with this edge. 
It's an intuitive representation because intensity is a function of motion history. Uh, it can be robust uh, to noise by uh, not just doing a pixel-wise operation by considering a sp small uh, spatial neighborhood, a uh, spatial temporal neighborhood, and doing some filtering of the timestamps. This representation can be uh, updated with every incoming event, although it may be expensive. Uh, if you have to recompute these kernels, it's expensive. If you uh, do not apply an exponential kernel, but just like a simple linear decay, then it would be more efficient. And it's also compatible with com conventional computer vision because after all, we are converting events into an image. And yeah, it's a time history image, but computer vision has been also developed to deal with those type of images. What are the disadvantages? Well, we only keep one pixel value, one value per pixel, uh, one timestamp, even if multiple events happen at the same pixel. And this representation is not good for texture scenes because uh, when there's lots of texture, lots of events happen at every pixel and there is a pixel overwrite and basically you don't see uh, nice uh, motion. You are constantly overwriting um, the pixel. You can see this, for example, in, in the corner detectors that use uh, time surfaces, they, they, the performance of these corner detectors degrade uh, when texture scenes are, are used. If we go move to higher dimensional representation, we have voxel grids, and that's represented kind of in this uh, video where events that are space-time and colored, uh, like here, red or blue, a spiral of events, <clears throat> they are converted into a re representation that is perhaps more popular in, in computer graphics. Um, they are voxel grids, right? So every voxel of the grid counts in the balance of polarities here, like red or blue, or it counts the number of events. So basically, voxel grids are 3D histograms of events where every voxel represents a space-time, a discrete cell in space-time. And the insertion mechanism could be that you every event votes for a single cell, and that's the nearest neighbor cell, um, near neighbor mechanism, or that every uh, event votes for, for example, two cells, and that could be like a linear voting mechanism. Using basically, you have a uh, one vote um, for every event, and this is split according to the distance from the location of the x, y, t coordinates to the nearest x, y, t coordinates of the voxels, two nearest voxels, and this is supposed to produce a smoother histogram. What are the advantages and disadvantages of this representation? Well, the advantages is that the, <clears throat> this representation preserves better the space-time structure of event data than to the re grid representations such as event frames and time surfaces. And it's also compatible with conventional computer vision with modern uh, deep neural networks. That's why kind of they were used. The disadvantage is that they, are, they require a lot of memory, more than two degrees. And the sparsity is lost because now many, many voxel values, many grid values are zero. You, there is this fill-in effect. And another disadvantage is that time is still quantized. We are not preserving the, the full timestamp of the events. <clears throat> we are binning, we are quantizing the timestamp into different bins. Another representation they are these motion compensated event frames, <clears throat> which they are not only a function of event data, but they also need a candidate motion field. So these uh, images we already know uh, on the left is something like a brightness increment image <clears throat> that is obtained by accumulating pixel wise uh, the polarities um, during a few milliseconds the polarities of the events. And now if we assume that we have uh, a motion, like a horizontal motion, then we could displace every event um, before we accumulate their polarities. And that's what you see here. If you displace them in the, in the correct amount, by the correct amount and direction, 
and then you add them, you add or count, uh, in this case, the balance of polarities, then you will see that the edges become sharper. And that's uh, basically the, the motion compensated event frames is this, uh, this output representation. What are the advantages? Well, they have an intuitive meaning. They produce uh, this representation. It's a sharp map of the edges causing the events. And they can be used to estimate motion field uh, that best fits uh, the events. And these sharp images, they can be used later for, for other processing stages, such as you know, corner detection or recognition. What are the disadvantages? Well, they require an estimation algorithm to compute them, and they are not fully motion invariant. They are somehow compensating for motion, but they are not fully motion invariant like absolute intensity. Which brings us to the next representation. So reconstructing intensity images. We haven't seen intensity images, brightness reconstruct intensity images yet, but they can be interpreted as a more motion invariant representation of the visual information contained in the events than the events themselves. So if this is an office scene, uh, and these are the, the events, so for example, uh, brightness intensity, brightness increment image in the last few milliseconds, basically a reconstructed image is we are trying to go from the events into absolute intensity that would look similar to and the intensity that you would acquire with with the standard camera. And we see here on, in the events that really the, the color of the events, some are white, some are dark, some edges by minimis independent on the motion, they depend on motion, whereas these reconstructed intensity images are representation that does not depend so much on the, on the motion, either the direction or the amount of motion. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, the advantage is that it's compatible with conventional computer vision uh, because we are from the events producing an image and then this image can be used for other things such as uh, visual inertial odometry, object detection, uh, many different things. And because these images are reconstructed from events, they inherit some properties of the events such as the high dynamic range and the high speed uh, of the events. The low. So it means that we can produce high speed, high dynamic range video from the events. And the disadvantages is that they are still expensive to compute. They have some latency because you need to wait for some events to, to generate these uh, reconstructed intensity images. And they still may contain some artifacts because uh, there might be missing events or uh, the algorithm may not uh, be suitable for one scene. Or they have some prior assumptions, so there might be still some noise or some artifacts in the, in the reconstructed images. Okay, so now that we have seen so different uh, representations, like a ZUA representation, then the question is why are there so many different representations? Well, event data is, uh, for one thing, unconventional, so we cannot directly use the methods that we know or we have for standard cameras, and yeah, we try different things. Um, so this is research, and people try new things and see if they work, um, obviously for the particular task and uh, for problem constraints. And uh, so representation may also be suggested by constraints on, on the method or the platform uh, such as if you use a specific hardware, then you know that this hardware uh, utilizes, uh, it's good for a specific type of representation, then you, you try to use this representation as much as possible because it's kind of enforced by the hardware that you're using. So there could be many different reasons for the representations. Uh, for one thing, we could be just trying to reutilize what we know and therefore we convert events into frames and then use a very powerful algorithm. Uh, others, they require um, maybe new, new methods, new tricks, and they might be a bit more difficult to come up with if we are not uh, familiar with this type of representation. We are not um, yeah, used to, to it or used to design algorithms with this different representation. 
Okay, which brings me to the, the interpretation that of visual codes, right? Events encode visual information. They are in, indeed, they are code. We are converting this uh, brightness uh, signal. So the, the light that arrives at the on the image plane, we are converting it into kind of a compressed signal uh, in, in these spikes, right? We are throwing away all temporal redundancy and we are representing this uh, a brightness signal into this format of um, brightness intensity changes. And then of course we could uncompress this code and thus could be thinking of in the way of reconstruction algorithms, right? That they take events and they, and they output uh, brightness intensity uh, brightness, brightness images, brightness video. They are kind of decoding the event stream to produce again a signal that is dense, uh, brightness signal that is uh, dense in space time. So events are in principle uh, a code of visual information, but there could be other codes and most likely other sensors, uh, they produce other types of codes. So, you know, polarized cameras, they, they use. Uh, they sense a different aspect of light, so they produce a different code of the light. And most of the representation that we have seen, uh, they are data preprocessing. If we want to build uh, higher levels uh, of, of uh, representation or abstraction in visual processing, this can be done. This can be built from events, which are this edge information. And this could be done using hierarchical structures, such as the one used in, uh, for time surfaces or for uh, artificial neural networks. And then the output of such networks, then it's it's yet another visual code, right? We have converted light into a code. And then, well, the boundary between representation and feature extraction is a bit fuzzy because now the code, as we call them now with these autoencoders, uh, is just uh, a compressed uh, version of the visual information. It's and it's also the features that we could use to pass them to a classifier to do some post-processing. Okay, and here are some references. Um, I encourage you to read section three of the survey paper uh, talking about event representations. There is this uh, paper at ICCV about uh, learning these representations and trying to unify them. And uh, a paper about the uh, reconstruction of brightness uh, images, brightness video, and trying to see them as uh, as an alternative motion, uh, more motion invariant representation. It's this last PAMI paper. Thank you very much.